So welcome back, everybody, and welcome to a new lecture. The topic today is a continuation of uh, the discussion of notations and also calculations of expectation values in what we normally call first quantization. And uh, when you see uh, all these nightmares of indices, which we have to keep track of, that in a way motivates the introduction of second quantization. And we are going to use the lecture today also to calculate some quantities which we will need later. Uh, we can actually simplify the calculation of uh, these expectation values. In particular, if we have uh, uh, transition probabilities from uh, wave functions which may differ more by more than some specific single particle states. And then depending on the type of uh, quantum mechanical operator you have, you may have elements which you can just zero out immediately by inspection. And that normally simplifies uh, some of the uh, uh, inputs to many body physics. Now, I wanted to give you uh, some kind of basic messages again. Uh, I apologize for sending the email late. <coughs> I was, I just forgot. And the, uh, uh, if, you, if you scroll down on the, uh, the GitHub page of the, of the course, you will find the uh, also the schedule. And what I do typically every week or after every lecture, I will upload the link to the, uh, to the video. So you can always revisit the video if you want to, if something was unclear. The, uh, uh, you will also find typical reading recommendations. And this week in particular, we are, and also the previous week, we've been uh, mainly covering material in this textbook by Sabo Nuslum, which you have access to. And chapters one and two actually give a very nice introduction, both to basic linear algebra and some of the linear algebra which is needed here, in particular, since we're going to deal with mostly fermion systems. So that means that we're going to deal with the determinants in a way to bake in the anti-symmetry. And then uh, there's also the first exercise set. And the plan is that we will use uh, Fridays in the morning from 8.15 to 10 to actually work with the exercises. And the exercises here, they follow parts of what we did last week and also things which we're going to do today. So today's lecture is going to give you some of the inputs to that set of exercises. So you will find the uh, weekly exercises here. I'm going to, you will receive an, an email with the, where you find the weekly exercises. And the thing which I've been struggling a little bit by some odd reason, it doesn't recognize this link of mine. Uh, but if you open up the files, as I wrote in the email, you will actually get access to the Jupyter book of the lecture notes. And this is something which I'm gradually building up. So that means that you can have access. If you do a Git pull, you have all the material which you need. And since I keep making changes to this, uh, it means also that you will, uh, uh, if you do a Git pull, you will get the latest update of that. So that link here is going to function as my kind of collected lecture notes. And then this other link is the kind of weekly material which we try to cover. Now, the, uh, uh, there was another thing I wanted to say, and I don't know if you have looked into that, but if you go to the uh, official website of the course here, uh, if you scroll down, you will see that when it comes to the examination, we have two projects, and that's the one which uh, we're trying to follow. However, if you go into the at least last I mean, yesterday when I looked into it, and you look at the examination here, it says something different. It says actually, it, and it's only in Norwegian, it's actually four projects and a final oral examination. So the thing which is correct is not this, but it's actually what you find on the beginning here. If you don't go to the semester page, but if you go to the, uh, to scroll down here and look at the examination. So there is a uh, there's an error in the uh, in the setup from the administration's side. Any questions to practicalities? You all got the email if you have time to check via Canvas. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is just to switch back to the whiteboard, and I want to remind you a little bit of what we did last week, and then we are going to generalize this to many particles, and then gradually we are going to. Uh, try to motivate the introduction of second quantization as a useful and handy way of calculating transition probabilities and expectation values. So let's uh, 
go back to the uh, to the whiteboard unless you have any questions last moment questions here and also feel free to ask questions anytime so uh, let me quickly remind you of uh, what we did last time uh, we made several definitions so a typical uh, single particle state so this is a quick repeat from last week of some of the basic definitions which we are going to use again and again so we are assuming that we have a single particle basis and this single particle basis has some quantum numbers alpha we have some uh, spatial degrees of freedom uh, combined with spin degrees of freedom and often you will see this in different disguises so you could see this like x so this basically means that we have this quantity here now x is something which we defined uh, to be the tensor product of the spatial degrees of freedom and the spin degrees of freedom so that means that when we look at the let's say an integral like d of x this means a sum over the spin projections so i'm just writing this as an ms and and this can be minus a half plus a half you can have a binary case you can this depends on the degeneracy which you get from uh, the spin value you can have spin three half spin five half so now we are specializing to fermion systems and then we have an integral over the spatial degrees of freedom and that means that we have a d of d like this of r to indicate that this is a multi-dimensional object now a multi-dimensional quantity or you would see it just like d of r with a vector sign so in the literature you will see many many uh, uh, different types of notations and the hope is that from the context you do understand what we are aiming at so i'm going to try to stay with this x without being too specific and then when we need the degrees of freedom like spin uh, we would have to introduce them this is often a hassle because people you will often see statements like this i mean it's easy straightforward to introduce the spin degrees of freedom in the equations you actually have to be a little bit careful so it's not always straightforward it's uh, rather it's better to call it tedious okay but now uh, what we are assuming then is that there exists a one body operator which we defined last week as an h of x and i'm just leaving x unspecified so this act could act on the spin degrees of freedom or it could only act on the spatial degrees of freedom and typically what we would have then is a kinetic energy operator and i'm just going to write this as a t so that's the kinetic energy i'm going to put hat on operators so this is normally used to indicate the kinetic energy plus some external potential and we just write this as an external and this is going to be a function of x this is also a function of x and a hat here <coughs> again without specifying whether there are spin degrees of freedom involved in the uh, uh, let's say the external potential as we said last time if you put a particle in a magnetic field this would be an example of a an operator which would act on the spin degrees of freedom so what we had is that this h0 acting on this state phi of alpha of x is equal to some epsilon alpha phi alpha of x so we are assuming that these are eigen states of this operator h0 with eigenvalues epsilon alpha and typically we would have an infinity of such states and we are going to make a answers for the wave function which is in the hilbert space which is going to be given by the tensor product of all these single particle states so that's the uh, so-called one body operator and then we introduce the many body operators and in the case of the hamiltonian we introduce an h which we call an h0 plus some interaction piece and the i here defines the interaction and this h0 is now simply the collection 
from i equal 1 up to the number of particles of this h0. And now we're just writing x of i here. Then uh, this h of i could be given by some interaction. And this is a double sum of i less than j. If you sum over i and j, you have to have a factor of a half. And this goes up to the number of particles. And normally, this is now given by the absolute value of the distance between the particles. But we can write this as xi and xj. The most normal case, the most standard case which you encounter, like if you have an interaction like the Coulomb interaction, or you have the strong force, or many other fundamental forces, they depend mainly, most of them actually do depend on just the relative distance. And that gives rise to some specific symmetries like translational invariance and permutational invariance. Okay, so th this were some of the definitions which we made last week. And then we made an ansatz for the uh, wave function of the, or the money body state function. But if we now look at these single particle energies, what we could do now is put a label. So we could put an alpha one, we could have an alpha two, and these states can have uh, different types of degeneracies depending on how we specify these alphas. So you could think of this alpha being doubly degenerate states. So you could have two fermions in each state. So remember now that the, this is now a picture which we are going to use to make a many body state. Now, this may not be the true uh, or the real uh, many body state. But there's an ansatz which we are going to use to build up a many body state. And then uh, this type of ansatz uh, is going to be this eigenstate, since it's going to be based on these single particle states. It will be an eigenstate of this operator H0. But it will not be an eigenstate of the exacta or the full Hamiltonian. So that means that the many body methods which we are going to introduce, what they strive at is actually to build in this missing contribution to the energy or to the expectation value of a specific operator. Because these uh, states which we're going to make, which we're going to call the computational basis, they will not be eigenstates of the full operator which we have. But they serve as a useful ansatz. And since they form a complete basis, so in principle this goes up to, let me just see, it goes up to some alpha n, for the number of particles we have. But it, in principle, it goes to infinity up here. So as we discussed last week, some, we have to make a truncation somewhere. And these are single particle states. So SP is going to be a single particle, the acronym I'm gonna use. So these are single particle states. And we have this single particle states phi of alpha. So what you could think of now is that we are filling all these single particle states here with a, a fermion. And now we assume now that these single particle states have just a uh, one particle occupancy. So every slot here now points to some specific quantum numbers, which characterizes this slot alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha n. And so this will be the final st step. Now what we're going to do then is that it's very common when you order these single particle states, you can actually make the ordering you want. But the typical ordering, since these states are eigenstates of a given Hamiltonian, is that they are ordered so that epsilon 1 is less than epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and etc. So it means that the kind of hierarchy which, have, which you have chosen now follows the single particle energies. Now then, we make an ansatz for a money body state, phi zero. And phi zero is now going to be a state which is represented by the first n single particle states being filled up. So we are going to build a money body state now, which is based on, so this phi zero, Actually, the kind of notation which we started with last week is actually to write this as a function of x1, x2, up to xn. And then we had the quantum numbers alpha 1 up to alpha n. 
And this was given by a so-called Slater determinant. And this is given by N. And then we have uh, phi alpha 1, x1. So we leave the first column to represent particle 1. And then we have x1. And this goes all the way down to alpha n of x1. And this is given by phi alpha 1 of xn. And down all the way to phi alpha n of xn. So this is an ansatz for the total wave function, uh, which is given by a determinant, which then respects the anti-symmetry. And what we discussed last week was actually that this function here, phi zero, is now given by the, is an eigenstate of actually the Hamiltonian. And where we now have this uh, uh, eigenstate epsilon zero. And what we discussed last week is that epsilon zero is actually the sum of i equal one up to n of all the single particle energies which we have. And we should put an L. If you go back now, we are going to, uh, since we are using this subscript alpha for one of the states, and we have been using i here, this should be an alpha of i. And this runs over alpha i, or rather i here, I should. Maybe we should just write it like this, alpha, we just write it. So this has an alpha of i, and we have an alpha of i equal one up to n. And we showed that for the two particle case last week. Now we're going to uh, calculate this for a many body state. So let's take a look at the, uh, the case when we now have more than two particles. And what is handy to do then is actually to introduce a new operator. So uh, before we move on, there is an important thing here which we have to uh, keep in mind. So H0 and HI may not commute. There's another important thing, this kinetic energy operator with this external potential may not commute in general. So this has consequences later when we're going to look at something which is called uh, the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff expansion. And then there's also a very popular method when you are dealing with Monte Carlo method, which is called Trotter-Suzuki approximation, which actually takes into account that when you write the operation of a unitary operator on a state function, then you have the exponential of the Hamiltonian. And this object is actually acting on your wave function. And if you think of a, a Hamiltonian operator where all the elements commute, then you can just write your exponential of the Hamiltonian as just a product of the different pieces. Mm -hmm. Else you would have to have a complicated Taylor expansion of your exponential, which is going to contain nested commutators. We are going to look at that. So keep that in mind that in general, this is not the case. The, the other thing which we are going to do now is to introduce an operator. So you remember that this Slater determinant, which we had here, we could rewrite that Slater determinant in a more compact way. So I'm gonna skip all the uh, indices here. And you will also see that this is one of the reasons why we introduce second quantization, because that gives us a much more compact way of representing a state. So I'm going now to rewrite that one in terms of uh, the term which we had last time. So we have an n factorial, and then we are summing over all the possible permutations. So this is a little p, and then we have a permutation operator. And this permutation operator is actually acting on a function which we called phi of h. So this phi of h it does not obey the symmetry requirements, whether these are bosons or fermions, but this is just given as a product of all these single particle states, x1, where we now have chosen an ordering. So remember again that last week we defined a specific ordering. When you are thinking of the permutations of a determinant. So in our case, we have chosen this type of ordering here with the single particle states. And we are writing this Slater determinant where the diagonal elements are just given by 
these different single particle states according to the ordering we've chosen. So the ordering you choose is important because when you're calculating expectation values and the specific transition probabilities, you would actually like to minimize the number of uh, quantities you have to store due to symmetries. And that means that you want to revert everything back to this ordering which you have chosen. That will actually save you a lot of memory in actual calculations. So we've chosen an ordering and that leads to the definition of this specific function uh, phi of h. And this is normally called in the literature, you will see that this is called the Hartree function because they, Hartree was the first one to introduce this quantity. So this is not limited to this state phi zero. So you could set up another determinant. Suppose now that instead of having uh, all particles below this alpha n, you have now one particle which is above alpha n, but you will still keep this hierarchy which you have chosen where you order typically these states and these levels according to the eigen energies. You can choose a totally different order, but this is convenient because when you are filling up the states, if the interaction piece is weak, it means that the energy is going to be close to the sum of these single particle energies. And that's also a very useful thing to think of. So the ansatz you make and the way you order the single particle states often follows your intuition about the physical system. Okay, so the, this is the Hartree function. And you can see that if we now look at the case with the n equal to two, as we did last week. So when we did n equal to two, what we had, sorry, not that one, n equal to, then what we have is the zero permutation. So we have one over two factorial like this. And if we write out this sum here, we have phi alpha one of x one, phi alpha two, of x2 but then we have the next permutation so that we have first zero permutations so it's a sum of all the permutations of pairs so this operator acts on the pairs of particles so when we then permute the two columns this simply gives us alpha 1 and then we have x2 and then i have alpha 2 x1 now, this operator has a very interesting property when we, when we look at this operator. So we can, we can actually rewrite uh, the uh, wave function, this ansatz which we have, by introducing a new operator, an operator which I'm going to call for A, and it's normally called the anti-symmetrization operator. So this has 1 over A factorial. So that's the uh, factorial of the number of particles which we're dealing with. But I'm just putting a factorial here. And then it has a sum of all the permutations, minus p, and we have this permutation operator here. So I should have put an, op uh, put an operator sign here. So if you now look at a equal to 2 here, this is the number of objects which we have. What you would have then when you write this out is that this a is obviously equal to one that's the first element zero permutations so it doesn't change anything and then we have minus if we have two particles and one and two divided by one divided by two now it's easy to prove it but i'm just going to demonstrate this for two particles so a squared is actually given by one minus p12 of a half and then I have multiplied with a half of one minus P one two. And what you get then is one over four. Then I have one, and then I have minus two P one two and plus P one two squared. So what is P one two squared? If you just permute a pair, if you're now acting, think of this as something which is acting on a state. So man, in many, in many cases, when we write quantum mechanics, uh, we are a little bit sloppy. When you look at the commutator like this, this actually means that you're acting on a state. 
So when I'm using this kind of notation, which you see here with a hat, the operator, I'm now assuming that's actually doing something on a state with two particles. So this would now be acting. You could think of this as a operator acting on this state alpha one, x one, alpha two, x two. So keep in mind also that alpha one and alpha two are slots of quantum numbers. And what you are changing then is operator actually interchanges x one with x two. That's what the operator does. But the first element in this summation here is zero permutation. So zero permutation gives you one. And one permutation obviously gives you a minus sign here because you, you have a, an, a power to the number of permutations. So if I do a P12 squared, what should I get then? Just one, exactly. So when you do that, you see that you get one plus one, two, you have one divided by four, minus two P12. So this is actually the same as A. So this is a typical example also of a projection operator. And you can actually show this for the more general case that A squared is actually equal to A. Okay, now this becomes a little bit more interesting for us now. Uh, I'm going to state without proof, but you can easily convince yourself about that. Uh, the first relation here is actually pretty obvious. So this is a one body operator. And if you then are to calculate expectation values of a quantity like this, what would you expect then? So now you're permuting and you have a one body operator. So remember now that this is a sum of one body operators and that acts only on one single particle at the, at the time. So if I do that, what would you expect for this specific operator here? Yeah, yeah, they commute. So it's actually not so difficult to show that. Then there is another case now. So we are going to have, and this depends a little bit, this statement which I'm making here now is not straightforward unless I make an assumption here that this V of X, I, J, is actually equal to V of Xi minus Xj. And this is normally written in a very compact way like Xij here. That's a typical notation which we are going to use again and again. Now, it is not obvious that what it will be, but I'm going to state it and you can easily convince yourself by making the calculations that this is also actually equal to zero. So that also commutes, and that is simply because when I interchange, so this actually means that this is the same as xj minus xi. So if I interchange two particles, this means that I also interchange in the potential, the two particles, the, the variable, and the integral then, which I'm going to calculate when I calculate an expectation value, is going to be unchanged. So this kind of uh, permutation symmetry is an important aspect of the uh, uh, operators which we're going to look at. And it means that uh, there are some specific properties like these commutation properties, which are very important. Now, with these assumptions, uh, so I'm stating this without a proof, but it's not so difficult to actually show that. Uh, I leave that as a small exercise if you want to. What we are going to use now we are going to use these properties to simplify the calculations of an expectation value. So what we want now is simply to look at the expectation value of this ansatz phi zero with a full Hamiltonian here. So what we need then is to look at the term with phi zero of H zero of phi zero plus and we did this last week for the uh, two-body case. We made an ansatz where we had two particles and we calculated these matrix elements. Now we want to generalize this and due to the definitions which we have put up here of the operator A, the way we write the Slater determinant and also the commutation properties of the Hamiltonian with this uh, operator A, 
we can actually simplify the calculations. Still, it's going to look a little bit messy, and it's going to kind of urge a kind of shorthand, which is given by second quantization. But let's go through this, because this is very useful. And it leads also to some calculation rules, which will allow us to write down uh, problems. Like if we want to do a full configuration interaction theory calculation, we can actually zero out matrix elements in the Hamiltonian matrix by just looking at the Hamiltonian itself. OK, so uh, let's take the first element here, phi 0 of h0 and phi 0. Now, what we uh, need then is actually to introduce this operator, which we have. Now, I need my cheat sheet here. OK, there we are. So this is now, I'm going to introduce a uh, shorthand. So I'm going to write a d tau, which is actually the same as dx1, dx2, up to dxn, because I have n particles. So that means that what I want now is to calculate phi 0 of h0 of phi 0. And this is going to be equal to an integral over d tau. And now I have my wave functions, the ansatz here, phi 0, complex conjugate, h0 acting on phi 0. So what I'm doing now is to actually write in uh, the Slater determinant as we wrote it here. So if you look at this expression here, but I'm going to rewrite this one in terms of that operator A. So this permutation operators is something which I'm going to rewrite in terms of this quantity here. So let's uh, do that. So this becomes equal when we now start writing out things. Uh, we are going to have an uh, uh, n factorial because we are introducing this new operator and we are going to have this product state it does not contain the anti-symmetries which we want this Hartree state and we're going to have a operator a another thing you will notice with that operator which we have defined here is that a is actually equal to a emission conjugate So we don't need to put the uh, conjugation sign here. And then we have an h0. And this is multiplied with a times phi 0. And then we have this integral. That's the compact notation. Now, uh, no, no, sorry. This is not h0, but this is actually phi of h. This is the product state. Now, what we do next now is to, when we introduce this operator, remember that this operator had a 1 over n factorial uh, factor. So that means that uh, when we put it up here, we then uh, can simplify the expressions. And what we can, what we would get then is actually a, yeah. So I defined uh, in the term here, this a is now going to be define the number of particles. So I'm plugging in the operator. So remember the Slater determinants. Let me just bring it up here. So when I put in n particles here, so this operator A is 1 divided by n factorial. And then I have this sum of the permutations of p hat. And then the Slater determinant, which I'm putting in, has term 1 over the square root of n factorial. So in order to bring in the operator, I actually have to multiply with n factorial here. Is that, is that OK? So what happens next then, if we now look at the expression here, so let me just put parentheses in here, so this contains all the rest. What we end up with then, is the following. So we know that these operators commute. So I can rewrite this one as h0 times a. And then I have a times a, and I know that a squared is equal to a. So that means that the term which I have here 
is actually n factorial. And then I have this integral. I have this multidimensional integral. I have this one. And then I have h times a times this phi of h here. OK, so the, uh, the uh, uh, term here, this a, is now defined in terms of 1 over n factorial. So that means that this n factorial disappears in here. And then I'm simply left with, when I write everything out, so this is actually a way to simplify the calculations a little bit, times h0 multiplied with this uh, sum over the permutations minus p and the permutation operator which now acts on pairs times phi of h. So now I'm just putting in the explicit expression for that specific operator. So what it means is now that if I take the zero permutation, so let's write this out now in uh, all the gory details. So I'm going to get an integral which now contains also spin, but may contain spin. So I have a dx n, and then I have my phi alpha 1 complex conjugate x1, phi alpha 2 complex conjugate x2, and this goes all the way up to <coughs> phi alpha n of xn complex conjugate. And then I have the operators h0, x1, plus h0, x2, and I'm just writing dots like this. And this is finally multiplied with all the permutations which I can, which I can make. So this is now given by the zero permutation piece, phi alpha 1, x1, phi alpha 2, x2, etc. And finally, alpha n, xn, plus all permutations beyond the zero permutations. So if you look at the first term, and if you now calculate the integrals, so remember now again that we have decided that these single particle states form an orthonormal basis. So that means that if I take an alpha i complex conjugate with an x of i times phi alpha i of x of i, this is going to be equal to 1. Else, it's 0. If uh, alpha i differ on the, on the, on the two, on, on, in the two-way functions. So that's all the other ones are 0. So if you now look at the first term, the zero permutation one. What happens, what would you expect as a contribution from that one? So if I'm going to write the contribution to the energy here. So remember again that H0 acting on an alpha i is equal to epsilon alpha i times phi of alpha i. The so as we did last week, last week we looked at the two uh, particle case, and then we got the sum of the two single particle energies. But the first term is going to give us a sum over alpha i equal one up to n of this epsilon alpha i. This is the first term. So that's this term here. Now let's look at one of the permutations. So one of the permutations could permute particle one and two. So if you look at all permutations, what you would have now, you would have a, a P12, P13, up to P1n. So that's one set of permutations. So when you sum of all these permutations, you will have all these terms here. Then, you get the next one, which will be P2 free. And this goes all the way up to P2 n. And then we can continue. We have P3, 4. So we're not, we're only counting the permutations once, right? And up to P3 n and so on. So if you just look at one, one of these, what would you expect they should give? 
So let me just spell out the kind of things you would have to calculate. So suppose now we are looking at dx1 and dx2. So we permute particle one and particle two. So this one of these contributions of so this specific contribution, all the other ones are unchanged. <coughs> and then we would have an alpha two of x2 complex conjugate. And then we are going to calculate hx1 plus hx2. And this is now multiplied with the terms we have permuted. So I'm going to have an alpha 1 of x2 and a phi alpha 2 of x1. Then I have all the other terms where I have a dx3 with phi alpha 3 phi alpha 3 and this goes all the way up to d or x of n so these are just the norms right so they are equal to one all these terms here become equal to one what about these two first terms we have from the permutations when you look at the integral they're all zero so that means that when you permute now beyond the no permutation, then all the contributions are going to give you zero. So that means that all these are zero. So that means that this, expect, this expectation value here of this phi zero, of h zero, of phi zero, is simply going to be given by the sum over all the single particle states which we have up to n, and this is an epsilon alpha of i. <coughs> so this is the first term which we need to calculate now there's obviously also an interesting thing here and that has to do with the uh, with the fact that uh, some of these operators we we are not always going to look at a general uh, hamiltonian like this but we could have a general operator and that means that if you look at this term here this is the same as a sum over alpha i equal one. And then we have this compact expression of alpha i of h zero of alpha i. So I'm just bringing up some of the definitions which we put up last week. And that is the same as this integral of dx multiplied with phi alpha i x h zero of x multiplied with phi alpha y of x. So these are kind of shorthands which we're going to use. Now, we don't need to have an operator. We could actually have a general operator, a general one-body operator, which is given by this, where we may not have diagonal matrix elements only, but we could actually have a one-body operator which acts on a single particle state, where alpha i of O of alpha j is different from zero. So we have assumed now that these states, alphas, are eigenstates of H0. But if we now replace this with another operator, this may not be the case. So this is something which is useful to keep in mind, but you would act, the calculational rules are exactly the same as we have here. So there's no difference, except that now we are plugging in uh, an operator which has these states as eigenstates. And that simplifies everything in the sense that we have just this epsilon alpha i. But in general, we may actually have to evaluate uh, more complicated one body integrals. <coughs> so if you're looking at electromagnetic transitions, that may actually connect states uh, phi alpha i with a phi alpha j. And it may not be diagonal in these states because these, I, these states which you have may not be eigenstates of another operator. Okay, any questions so far? So the next thing we're gonna do now is actually to calculate phi zero with h of i and phi zero. And I see that uh, we are getting now close to the hour. 
so it's good to take a small break and I'm just going to stop the recording here okay so the uh, next thing we need to calculate is uh, the uh, expectation value of this uh, two body or more complicated interaction operator so in, in this course we're going to mainly stay with a uh, two body interaction so it's going to affect the degrees of freedom of two particles at a time it means that uh, if you want more complicated stuff like a free body or four body and so on then clearly that would involve interactions between three particles four particles and so on if we are dealing with systems in solid condensed matter physics uh, atomic physics uh, molecular physics quantum chemistry in general then we are essentially dealing with two body interactions and the standard interaction is the coulomb interaction because we're dealing with uh, charged particles and they either like each other or they repel each other and then uh, if you're diving into a field like nuclear physics on the other hand then uh, you may have to uh, worry about free body forces four body forces and so on because these will be effective forces which represent the quark degrees of freedom and uh, normally you in uh, nuclear physics calculations you would freeze out these degrees of freedom and you have effective degrees of freedom like nu neutrons and protons and they uh, when you have an effective theory that uh, produces automatically more complicated forces like free body four body and so on and that clearly complicates life now so let's look at the uh, uh, expectation value for this quantity and in this specific case uh, we're just going to, to set up the uh, basic definition again so the complex conjugate of the slater determinant we have uh, the operator again the wave function or the state function and then we have this uh, multi-dimensional integral and when we now uh, look at the interaction it means that we have a sum of i less than j so this is the interaction matrix elements which we have to plug in and then uh, we would put in and perform the same operations as we did before with this anti-symmetrization operator so let me quickly remind you of that so if you look at what we did in the beginning with the h0 operator we plugged in this anti-symmetrization operator and whether this is a one body or two body or more complicated type of operator we always end up with a term which looks like this so the only thing we need to replace when we do the algebra here and i hope you don't get offended if i just skip doing these operations again uh, the only thing we need to put in is actually this one so when we then go back and look at the expectation value here this uh, is going to be given now by an integral where we have this d of tau uh, we'll just leave it unspecified and then we have uh, uh, phi complex conjugate of this no of this h the Hartree term and then we need to multiply with the interaction and then we have an interaction which depends on these degrees of freedom xi and xj and then we have this uh, uh, operator we have to sum over all the possible permutations so we have a sum over p and then we get minus p and then we have the operator and this is multiplied with this Hartree state so this is essentially what we end up with having to calculate now so the uh, the thing we have to look a little bit more carefully at when you look at these expressions here is now the following so uh, this permutation here this is a sum of all the possible permutations so what we would have then if we now look a little bit closer at it for the many particle state which we are dealing with since this acts only on two operators at a time so it would have a minus of one and then i have a minus p12 they're going to be a minus p13 etc and this would have be the sum of all the possible permutations on two and two particles okay that's a, yeah uh, I'm just wondering uh, the expression here, yeah. the potential. Uh, then you used 
uh, the same thing as for the uh, embodied theory from the day with the uh, yeah. Antonio. Yeah. But uh, in, uh, can you do that in general if you have xi, xj, or is it only if you have like a relative distance? So you system? have to make an assumption here. So the assumption we made is that this v is just a function of the yeah, absolute okay. value. So that's, so that's a very important assumption. And we are going to look at mostly at Hamiltonians like that. However, as you say, I mean, this is a very important uh, issue. If that's not the case, we cannot make this assumption that it commutes. And then all this machinery fades. So just keep that in mind because then uh, we cannot uh, use that property which we put up here. So that's an important, that's an important issue. Now, if we now look at uh, what we have here, uh, if we go down, so uh, remember now that uh, these are sums over xi's and xj's. So we have this uh, sum here. So it's going to pick two particles at a time. So suppose now that you're picking particle one and two. So if you now look at this uh, expression, so let's now look at the specific case here. So just to build up your intuition about what you're going to get. So let's take away the sum and just let's look at the specific contribution. And now we are looking at the phi alpha one, complex conjugate x one, and then we have phi alpha two, x two, etc. And we are looking at the term where we now just have x one two. So that acts only in particle one and two. That's one of the terms in this sum here. So we are performing this sum over all the pairs. And now let's just look at one pair. Now this one pair here obviously has to be multiplied with one minus P12 minus P13, all the possible permutations you can make. And this is again multiplied with phi alpha one, X one, phi alpha two, X two, phi alpha three, X three, etc. Now, so let's look at uh, first at this term, and then we look at this term, and then let's take a look at this term as well. So let's do that. I hope you don't get offended if I go slowly forward here, because uh, uh, when you we can generalize this to uh, uh, different slater determinants, we don't need to have the same states on the bra and the ket side. And that's going to lead to a general rule for setting up these kind of transition probabilities or matrix elements, as we are going to call them. So we typically end up calling these for either matrix elements, transition probabilities, or sometimes it's an expected value, expectation value. Now we are taking, when we have the same state on the bra and the ket side, then we are talking about an expectation value. If I had another slater determinant, another state here, then this would be a transition probability, the probability of making a transition from one to another one. And that will re be reduced to some elements, which we often translate into a Hamiltonian matrix. And then we typically call them for just matrix elements. So sometimes I just interchanged uh, the, the kind of uh, naming of these different quantities. So let's look at these different terms now. So let's say we put, pick the first term. So when we pick the first term, what we have is a dx1, dx2 here, and then we have a phi alpha 1, x1, phi alpha 2. So when you've done this exercise with all the indices, you're actually crying after a more simplified notation here. And this is multiplied with, so let's take the first term here. So we would have a phi alpha 1, no, it's not, sorry, alpha 1, x1, phi alpha 2, x2. So that would be this specific term here. And then this is multiplied with dx3, phi alpha 3, x3, phi alpha 3, x3, and all the other ones. And I'm just writing them in a simplified way like this with dots. 
So we know that all these are normalized. So these are auto, it's an orthonormal basis. So these are normalized to one, all of these integrals. So we are just left with uh, this specific integral here. And you remember that this specific integrals is something which we, last week, we labeled this as an integral alpha one, alpha two of V, alpha one, alpha two, right? That sound okay? That's the kind of labeling of that integral. So that would be the first term with no permutation. But let's now look at the second term when we make a permutation. So we would have a minus, and then I have a dx1, dx2, phi alpha 1, x1, phi alpha 2 of x2 here. And then I have a v, x1, 2. This is now multiplied with a permuted term. So I have an alpha 1, but in this slot I have x2 now. And then I have an alpha 2 with an x1. And then I get the same integral which I had before, dx3 up to dxn. And this, all these integrals are equal to 1. So this is also an element which is non-zero, right? <clears throat> we don't know whether it's zero or not. It depends on the wave functions here. You will later see when we plug in spin that we have to be a little bit careful here. So spin always complicates life. But this is an element which we last time, which we just labeled as an alpha one, alpha two of V, and then we had an alpha two, alpha one. So that was a kind of labeling which we have because we've swapped the slots for x2 and x1. These are just scalars, so I can obviously always put that one back in there, right? And that's why I have this alpha two here. Now, if we now look at the next term, so let's take the minus P1 free. So instead of permuting particles one and two, we permute particles one and three. Now, in this specific case, however, what we have still have is that we have the potential matrix element with x1, x2, okay? So let's take uh, the next term. So we get a minus, and now we have a dx1, a dx2, and let's just write dx3 as well here. And then I have a phi alpha one, x1, phi alpha two, x2 here, phi alpha three, x3, this is unchanged. This is multiplied with V, still x12, right? It only acts on these two guys. And then I made a permutation, so I have an alpha one, and now I have an x3 here. And then I have a phi alpha two, x2 is unchanged. And then I have a phi alpha three, x1. <laughs> and then I have the remaining integrals, dx4, etc. So if you look at these terms, what should they become? If you now look a little bit carefully, so this acts, the interaction acts only on x1, x2. And if we pick x1 and x2, we have x1 here and x2 here. We have x1 here and x1, 2 here. So when I calculate this uh, two body integral, it's not given that this may, may be zero. That's not, it, it is not necessarily equal to zero. But then I have x3 now. So I have this integral. So I made the permutation, but x3 is here now and here. Zero. zero. So you see now that if I now repeat this for all the other ones, they have to be zero. So when you then run this kind of uh, summations, what is going to happen since you have a two body interaction, it picks only two particles at a time. And you can generalize this. So the general expression, when you set up this expected value, phi zero of h i of phi zero, you can actually rewrite that in a much more compact way. So you would have a sum of i less than j up to the number of particles. And then you would have this product phi h complex conjugate. And then I have the matrix elements 
V of X I J. And this is now acting on only one permutation where I permute I and J. So I'm putting this uh, indices I and J to indicate that the permutation picks only the two guys which are interacting. And this is finally multiplied with this phi of H and D of tau. <coughs> and when you then sum up everything, you're going to get terms. In this case, we picked particles one and two. We get this term and we get that term. When I pick particles one and three, I, instead of alpha two, I will have alpha three. When I pick particle four, I will have alpha one and alpha four and so on. So you can actually sum this up. And this is actually going to be a sum over, and I'm just going to write alpha i less than alpha j up to the number of particles. And I'm going to write this in a compact way, which is alpha i alpha j v alpha i. So this kind of two body integrals minus alpha i alpha j v alpha j alpha i. You can now sum freely if you want. That's another possibility. And you can actually rewrite this one as one half. And then you could have a sum alpha i alpha j of n. And then you would have alpha i alpha j v alpha i alpha j. And you see that if alpha i is equal to alpha j, then these two terms cancel because two particles cannot be in the same single particle states. So this is actually the Pauli principle which kicks in at the level of the single particle states. So the Pauli principle states that the many particle wave function has to be anti-symmetric. When we use this ansatz with single particle states, the consequence of the Pauli principle is that you cannot have more than one fermion in each single particle slot. That's a consequence of the principle. It's not the principle itself. And the Pauli principle is not a principle, it's just an answer about nature. Let's see, yeah. Sometimes they, they're called theorems or whatever, but in many cases they're just ansatzes about nature. And you remember that last week, we actually rewrote this in terms of anti-symmetrized matrix elements. So we would define a collection of these two. So that means from a computational point of view, what you would do then is simply to calculate the anti-symmetrized. So we put the label like this, and that would contain alpha i, alpha j, v, alpha i, alpha j, minus alpha i, and that simplifies the notation. So in many textbooks, you will actually see people using this anti-symmetrized matrix elements. So you, when you run calculations, instead of storing two matrix elements, you just store one, and that saves space. Okay, any questions so far? So in the exercises, I mean, the first exercise, you're actually going to play around with these equations here. Now, one thing I wanted to do now for the, uh, I mean, for the last part of the lecture here. Yeah? Yeah? If, if you put if you put them equal if you have the sum here right the sum runs freely yeah this integral yeah. You don't know. It could be zero. It could be. So this term, which you see here, is called the exchange term. And this is called the direct term. And when you go to Hartree Fock theory, the first term is called Hartree. And the second term is called the Fock term with an O. It's, it's very easy to make. 
stupid and lame jokes about Humphrey Fogg theory. Yeah, so if, if that, uh, So then, then it would be zero. But you also have to be careful with the spin values, because uh, if you look at the state here now, so suppose I add spin. So let's uh, let's do that, and then you will see that uh, you have to be a little bit careful. So when you're constructing the matrix elements, there is a spatial integral. So remember now that these x's, which we have, they represent a summation over spins and an integral over the spatial degrees of freedom. So suppose I put spin now, right? And what these integrals means is I'm summing over the spins. So if now, suppose alpha 1 is a spin-up state, and alpha 2 is a spin-up state, and this is also spin-up state and a spin-up state, then it's OK. OK? Because the orthogonality of the spin states, alpha 1 and alpha 2, would be 1, 0, multiplied with 1, 0. However, if I change the spin values, so suppose alpha 1 is a spin up and alpha 2 is a spin down, what happens then is that I have spin down here and I have spin up, but now this is particle 2. And that gives 0. So that means we have to be careful when you introduce spin. So that's why in textbook it says it's straightforward to introduce the spin degrees of freedom. We skip them in the notation, but it's actually tedious to trace them back again and make sure that you respect the orthogonality in these sums. So that's a good question. So we are just going to set up the matrix elements uh, as more abstract quantities. So these are normally called matrix elements. Or you can call them transition probabilities if you prefer that. OK, so the, um, uh, th this will be the definition of that quantity. Now, the thing which I wanted to do now is to generalize this, because what we did now was just to look at phi 0 of h to a phi 0. So this would be an expectation value. Let's look at the transition probability of a given operator. So let's change h to an operator O, and without specifying fully. And let's also change this phi 0 to a general Slater determinant. Let's just call it phi. OK? And then we can now look at the matrix elements, which are of the or transition probabilities between different Slater determinants on the bra and the ket side. So let me just introduce a, a, a new or kind of notation here. So we opted for this kind of single particle basis, alpha 1, alpha 2, up to some alpha n, like this. And we had assumed for this phi 0 that in that specific case, we now assume that all these slots were filled up with particles, with n particles. But we could have a general Slater determinant. So we, if we go back now to this single particle basis, and now I'm going to put up to this state alpha n, we are going to give this a labeling, which we will keep when we deal with fermionic systems. So this is going to be an alpha i, alpha i here. So I'm just going to call this one f, and that's called the Fermi level. Now, the way we are going to look at things is to actually, when we move to a second quantization, this is normally also called the number representation. Then when we describe a physical system, we are going to look at that in terms of excitations around the Fermi level. Normally, if you deal with what's normally called first quantization, where you have all the single particle degrees of freedom, the positions of the particles, and so on, you let particles interact infinitely many times to produce a final expectation value. What we have now, on the other hand, since this is an infinite basis, we have an infinite set of single particle energies. Normally, we put a truncation here, a lambda, 
for how many of these we want to handle or we can handle in a money body calculation. This means that we can obviously distribute these particles in all these given slots. So let's suppose now that this is given by an alpha of m. That's the last state we have. So we've made a model space where we have alpha 1 less than alpha 2 or the single particle energies epsilon alpha 2, epsilon alpha 3 and this goes up to epsilon alpha n. These are the states we fill and we make that as an ansatz for the ground state. And this continues all the way up to some alpha of m, epsilon. These are the energies. And we are going to order the states according to the energies. So what I could have now could be a new slater determinant. And I'm going to have a new determinant. So I'm going to define a determinant, which I'm going to write like an alpha i here. And I'm going to put an alpha j here. So this is a notation which is going to make it distinct from the one which we had before. So when we had phi zero, this was proportional to this product of alpha one, alpha two, so phi alpha two up to phi alpha n. Now what I'm going to have is a new determinant. So this new determinant is going to be proportional with phi alpha i one phi alpha two and then there's going to be a an open slot here i minus one and then i have a phi alpha i plus one so alpha of i is not filled and then this continues and it has the final state which is this alpha of i oops So how does that translate into this uh, image which we made? So we made this image here. So we have alpha one, alpha two. This is filled up, filled up. All the other ones are filled up, but then I have this alpha i, which is empty. And then I fill up all the other ones up to this alpha n. So I have n minus one particles here and then i have this uh, fermi level as it's called and then up here i have now filled the particle alpha i here so that's in this specific slot there no sorry alpha j which i put here actually this should be j sorry okay Later, we're going to, to use a slightly different naming just to be more compact. So we've made a Slater determinant where we actually have emptied this spot and we have promoted this up here. So in the language, in the kind of jargon which we are going to introduce, uh, the, uh, this specific state is going to be seen as a one particle, one hole excitation. So when you knock out one particle here you leave a hole below the fermi level and then you create a particle above the fermi level so this is normally called a one particle one hole excitation around the choice you have made for ground state ansatz so this state and let me remind you of that the true ground state is going to be given by a linear combination of all these Slater determinants, which we can make. So we would have a Psi zero, that's a true ground state. That is going to be a sum of I equal zero, and in principle to infinity, because I can make, I have an infinite number of single particle states. So this would have a zero of I, and then I have these specific Slater determinants, which I have defined, and they, are given by the ways you can distribute these particles. So I'm preparing you for the kind of language which we are going to use. And you see that you have an infinity of such one particle, one hole excitations, because you have an infinity of states above this Fermi level. There's nothing which limits you to make two particle, two hole excitation, or to have promote two of these below the Fermi level to above. 
So when you think of the full space, your full Hilbert space, money body space, that is going to be given by the way you can distribute these particles in these single particle slots. That's going to define your money body space. And if you can calculate to infinity, if you can do that, then you have the exact wave function in terms of a computational basis. This again is what we last week called the computational money body basis. And we have used a computational single particle basis to build a computational money body basis. So in one of the exercises next week, you're going to show that this computational money body basis is also an orthogonal basis because the single particle basis is orthogonal. So that's an exercise you're going to do next week. And that's also an important feature of what we're doing here. So if the single particle basis is orthogonal and actually orthonormal, then the money body basis, which is built upon this basis, is also ortho orthogonal and normalized. And we can then, when we have such a complete basis, then we can expand the exact solution in terms of that basis. And many body physics is all about you hoping that the first component is the one which does the job. So if you calculate this expectation value with phi zero to phi zero, you're hoping that that gives the largest contribution to the energy. All the rest is hopefully just some kind of a small contributions which you can evaluate with different money body methods. So money body physics is actually to bring in information about the exact expectation value beyond the answers you make for the ground state. So I hope you can see the, this is kind of the overarching picture which I want to give you uh, while we are moving on here. And we are building an ansatz uh, for uh, many, many reasons. One of the important reasons is that often this single particle basis is a basis where you have analytical wave functions. And that means that in many, many cases, you can ev even evaluate these integrals analytically, or they are easy to evaluate numerically. So you can make the table. And if you have analytical expression, even better, and then you can calculate money body expectation values. But you need to be able to calculate these contributions here, which we often end up in a sloppy way to just call matrix elements. Okay, so the, uh, uh, this was a little bit about the, the kind of uh, general picture. So let's now go back a little bit and look at the expectation value between a general Slater determinant and this H and a Slater determinant, which now differs only by two single particle states. That's the only difference. Okay. And the thing is that now we can use uh, these operators, which we defined, and we can find a general expression for these different contributions. So in order to be a little bit more specific, let's look at a case with n equal to four, okay? So, and what we are going to do now, we are going to take the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, H0 and the H1 contributions. So we're going to look at both of them. So let's look first at H0, or we could think of a general operator which is a one body operator. So I'm gonna put a one here to indicate as a one body operator, or we could look at the two body operator. So we, we are not locked to look at the Hamiltonian. So sometimes we may not be interested in the energy, but we may be interested in transition probabilities due to electromagnetic transitions, for instance. Okay, so the, um, uh, let's just look at the kind of matrix elements which we end up with. And I'm going to be a little bit sloppy with the, with the all terms. So I'm just going to look at those which are interesting for us. So we have four particles, dx2, dx3, and dx4. 
And now we are going to use the expressions which we use. We are going to assume now that, for instance, they commute and that we can calculate these integrals easily. So what we would have then would be an alpha one of x one phi alpha two of x two. So this is a case with zero permutation. This is multiplied with phi alpha three. So now I'm just assuming that this state, this phi which I put up here, could be now the state where we have just uh, these slots, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and alpha four and we place the particles in there. Then we have a, an operator, and we have assumed that this operator actually commutes with this anti-symmetrization operator. So we made that assumption. So we have a general, let's now say we have a one-body operator here, one, which acts at one particle at a time. And then uh, this operator translates into one which acts on x1 plus o of x2 plus o1 of x3 plus o1 of x4, like this. And then we have to look at the permutations now. Now, this is going to be multiplied with, and now I have a phi. So I'm assuming now that uh, this a new Slater determinant has alpha 1, alpha 2 in the same slots, but then it has changed alpha 3. So I'm putting a prime on it. So when I wrote it like this, here with an alpha i, alpha j, this was just to indicate that it differed from this one by two single, by one single particle state. So this means here, that suppose now I take this one, what is the case now is that alpha three prime is not the same as alpha three. So I take x three, and then I have alpha four here, of x four. And then I have the permutations, plus p one, plus p one three, plus p one four, and then I have the different signs and so on the sum of all the permutations I can make. So just to reinstate it, I have alpha free, different from alpha free prime. Now, if you now look at this contribution here, uh, clearly when uh, H0, no, or this O1 acts on X1. So if I take, suppose I take this contribution here, what would you expect to get then if I have an operator acting on X1? Zero. And if I take X2, same. I take X4, the same. So the only case now for the zero permutation which I have, so this zero permutation is actually uh, the case when X3 takes now X3 here, and x3 here. If you look at all the other permutations which you have here, they will always give zero, always. And it's easy to convince yourself. So actually this integral, what it ends up in is the following. So it becomes equal to the integral of dx3 phi alpha three And I have the one body operator x3 of phi alpha prime x3. And this is something we can write out in a more compact way. So this is actually the only contribution which we get of O1 and then alpha three prime. This is the only non-zero contribution. So this clearly tells you that if you have a one body operator and a wave function on the brass side and the ket side, which differ by only one single particle state. There's only one contribution. And clearly, if this H or no, O I acting on a state alpha free is given by an eigenvalue alpha free or alpha free here, 
and alpha free prime is different from alpha free, this is automatically zero due to the orthogonality of the states. But if it's not the case, if these are not, if these states are not eigenstates of this given operator, then that is not necessarily equal to zero. If this is this uh, uh, one body part of the Hamiltonian, this is normally equal to zero. And that means that for the Hamiltonian itself, we just get the contribution of the single particle energies. Okay? Now, now we can do the same thing and look at the two-body operator. And if we do the two-body operator, the, uh, the difference then, so if we now let this operator O, we let that become a two-body operator, and we are still assuming that this two-body operator commutes with this anti-symmetrization operator, because else life is going to be much more messy. So this is a basic assumption which we are going to make, and that means that we this operator here is going to be a function of the relative distance between the particles. So I'm just going to write this as an xij here. Now, if we do that, we uh, if I now look at that specific term, uh, we are going to get contributions. Uh, so instead of, uh, and we are going to finalize that tomorrow. So if you go back a little bit, so when we took the expectation value, as you can see here, then we have a sum of alpha i and alpha j. If we let the ket side differ by one single particle state, the double sum will reduce to a single sum. Then I can do the next exercise and I can make the wave function differ by two single particle states on the ket side from the bra side. Then the double sum will just reduce to a single term. If I have more than three or three and more single particle states which differ in the ket state and in the bra state, and I have a two body interaction, what would you expect? We're going to see that tomorrow, by the way you will get zero. So that means that if you, uh, when actually when you are setting up a code and you want to find these matrix elements, you will often encode these slater determinants as bit strings. And then you can simply compare bit strings on the bra and the cat side. And if they differ more than two bits and we have a two body interaction, zero. That's a very easy way to implement this test. So you can easily see when you have fermions, you can encode the information about the Slater determinant as a bit string. Occupied state, bit one. Unoccupied, bit zero. So if you have 10 single particle states, you need 10 bits to encode the information. And if you have four particles, you will have four bits, which will be different from zero. And then when you're comparing the Brani ket side to find out whether there's a contribution or not, you just do a bit comparison. And if they differ by more than two bits, zero. We are going to look at these things gradually when we introduce second quantization as well. So the I'm going a little bit slowly through these things because I want you to think of ways we are representing things and the kind of approximations we make in terms of an ansatz for the system. We have an infinite single particle basis. We build a money body basis, computational basis, which will be orthogonal because the single particle basis is orthogonal. And then with an orthonormal basis, we can expand the true states, the true eigenstates in terms of the computational basis. If the computational basis is very good or is uh, appropriate for the physics you're looking at, then you will need few terms to represent the true function. If you've chosen a crappy basis, then you will need many, many terms to represent the uh, true wave function or the true state function. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.